to reveal himself. Yeah. Do you know what? The, ah, what a joy to discover that God's not easily offended. He's not, he's not standing there at the back saying, how's the worship going? I'm not liking that song. I'm here. No, but hey, God, this God, He gets involved in your greatest mess and brings peace. He gets involved in the deepest done that you've ever thrown yourself in. He's not easily offended. He's excited about your life. He is so excited about each one of you. You know what? You wouldn't be here if God wasn't excited about your life. Because this God is the God who knows the end from the beginning. And long before He formed you, Jeremiah says, He knew me before He made me. God knew you intimately, individually. Long before He made you. He knew you'd be a bit of trouble. <laughs> it says in his book was written every day of your life, even before there was one of them. Right. But here you are. And um, <laughs> your very existence is evidence that when God dreamt of you, he enjoyed what he drank about. Oh, amen. And so you are sitting here tonight as a dream of God come true. Wow. Amen. 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 Wow. Yes. Oh, glory. <laughs> Papa. I don't, I don't I mean, are you okay with that? Just follow a little bit yes, in yes. whatever bursts up and then I'll get down yes. into a message. But Amen. You know, I just I just sense that God so wants to convince you that uh, there's nothing in him that wants to control you. He's got no agenda to limit you. He's got no desire to, to cramp your star. <laughs> He's got only one agenda for your life, and that is to set you free. To be fully and truly yourself. God has got no suspicion towards His own image and likeness. (laughs) He knows you. He knows you. He understands you intimately. What He knows about you excites Him about your life. What He knows about you (laughs) is what He comes to declare in the Gospel so that you can know even as you have always been known. Now, Obviously, in life, we, we face a lot of situations and, uh, and difficulties and disappointments and pain. And, uh, and you might think, but my goodness, I don't know, is this really God's dream for my life? It feels like there was quite a few nightmares in it so far. And um, it is possible, undoubtedly, it's possible for you to confuse yourself about who you are. Right. It's possible for you to de- take detours. <laughs> it's possible for you to confuse everybody around you. <laughs> Amen. But God has never been confused about who you are. Amen. And so He made up His mind about you even before He formed you. That is what uh, Ephesians 1 verse 4 says. He called you, He named you. (laughs) He knew you by name. It wasn't just some vague idea of a concept called humanity. God knew you individually. (laughs) And, And He called you into a place of intimacy, a place of innocence. He called you to be blameless, holy before yes. Him in love. Yes, right. Good. Amen. When? 
when you performed well enough to impress Him? When you proved your faithfulness? When you, when you uh, gave Him the depth of your regret? Or the sincerity of your repentance? Is that when God changed? Hey, it's not your repentance that leads God to goodness. Come on, Come on. <laughs> it's the revelation of yeah. God's goodness right. yeah. that leads us to a change of mind. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, he made the decision for you long before you made the decision for Him. <coughs> he knew you before He formed you. <laughs> And what he knew about you then is still his only reference for who you are. Mm. So I want to maybe just clarify that because, you know, so often we think, you know, we have faced so much contradiction. We have faced so much confrontation in our life. We was God, and, and when it comes to the subject of faith, mankind has always had many questions for God. Um, and, and basically, many people are a bit afraid to ask these questions, so I'm going to just be bold tonight and ask it, <laughs> even on your behalf. <laughs> and, um, I'm so glad God's not nervous of questions. <laughs> he loves it. <laughs> so here's the first question. Does God have a clue what it's like to be you? Yes. <laughs> I mean, this is the God who's to whose eyes all things are open, says Hebrews 4. Yeah. The God who sees all. Does he have any idea what it's like to be human, to be limited to just what is visible most of all, to be constrained by, by, by the blindness of, of our cultures, of our upbringing? Because how much of your character, your personality is just the response to the environment in which you grew up? Does he, does he really have a clue? I mean, how does a God who knows all things, how does he know what it is like not to know all things? <laughs> Has he ever been in a situation where the outcome wasn't clear? Has he, has he ever faced uh, uh, circumstances where... where there was real danger. I mean, he's omnipotent. He can do all things. Does he really understand what it's like to be human? To, to be in, in situations where you do not know the outcome. To face uncertainty. Has he ever lived by faith and not by sight? Yeah. Job is very bold in in his conversation with the Lord and in Job 10 verse 4 as Job faces all kinds of contradiction and, uh, 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 and pain in his life and, and he just says to God have you ever seen with the eyes of man and have your days ever been like the days of man <laughs> you see we, we ask these questions because we wonder, does he really have a clue? <laughs> what he's asking of us? <sighs> and then you know, if life was only neutral, faith wouldn't be so unusual. But, but often our uncertainties become frightfully clear. And here where we live, there is pain, there is injustice. Here where we live, there is, there is disappointment. Does he have any clue what it's like to be here? Has the immortal God ever faced 
death. <laughs> does, does he know what it's like to feel God forsaken? <laughs> God comes to answer us in the clearest, most definite way possible in the event called the Incarnation. This yes. event in which He willingly subjects Himself to all the limitations of being fully human. Yes. This event in which He steps into our fragile flesh, into this domain of confrontation and contradiction. He comes into the very midst of our existence yes. and He is as fully human as you are you yeah come on <clears throat> for the majority of his life he lives as just the ordinary guy he knows what it's like to just go through the routine the mundane routine of doing what needs to be done to feed the family to to earn the income he's a carpenter and uh, I mean, in those days, you could only do so much carpentry in your, your town. There's only so many tables and chairs to be made in a small town. And, and when you travel to wherever there's a project, a new boat to be built, a new building going up, and, and <coughs> so he knows the, the very routine and mundane, mundaneness of human life. But... In um, Matthew 6, when Jesus starts saying, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, what you will wear. He's not got some broadband connection to heavenly poetry that he could just access every time, <laughs> just bless people with a, a few verses. This is because Jesus faced situations and had every opportunity just like you have to worry yeah. to be anxious <laughs> to wonder what am I going to eat what am I going to wear maybe he traveled from one of his projects to another project and he realized I only have enough money for for a, a few more days and I don't know where the next job's going from coming from and and as he walked, because, you know, he laid aside all his divine privileges. Jesus is not omnipresent. He's in one place at one time. Yeah. Jesus is not omniscient. He has to grow in wisdom and knowledge. He has to access the mind of God, just like you and I have to. In conversation with his Father, he's walking to the, to the next job. And, and as he has all these opportunities to worry, to be fearful, his daddy starts talking to him and he says, Hey, do you see those birds? <laughs> I mean, look how excited they are. And, and look, that one found the worm. Who do you think provided that? Right? Hey, have as much sense as the birds. And do not worry about your life. And look, Look at these flowers. I mean, Solomon in all his glory was not uh, arrayed and dressed like these. And most of them will never be seen. If I pay such attention, give such detailed attention to flowers that's just trampled underfoot and thrown in the fire, then you need to realize that if you are of infinitely more value to me, how much more is it my desire to adorn you, to beautify your life, to spoil you in every possible way I can. And so Jesus, in, in His very ordinary human life, discovers a spectacular faith. He discovers the ability to see the extraordinary in the ordinary. He discovers how to see value 
treasure in the wasted life of a prostitute. I mean, why, why did the prostitutes, the tax collectors, the outcasts of societies, why did they flock to Jesus? Yeah. If they just wanted to hear how wrong they were, they could go to any synagogue in town. <laughs> but they didn't go there. They flocked to Jesus. Because something in his communication, something in his eyes, convinced them that he can still see them. Yes. Even where I cannot. We have a friend, um, the first time the Lord called us to, about two years ago, well, I say the Lord called us. I basically came to a point where I said, Lord, I'm bursting. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go share this somewhere. Are you coming? I said, where should we go? And uh, I just felt the Lord said, uh, Budapest. <laughs> I've never been to Budapest. I don't know any history of Budapest. I've got no clue what, what this place is, but I said, okay, Budapest. I mean, I don't know anybody there, but can you make a way? And um, that same day I got the email from a guy in Budapest that said on Facebook, he said, hey, I see your latest book, Imagine's coming out. And um, I would like to get it, but I'm in Budapest. How do I get that? So, <laughs> <laughs> I email you back and I say, well, what are you doing next Saturday? I'll deliver. <laughs> he, he was a bit surprised. Yeah. <laughs> and we went and we sat with his precious friend, Joseph. We shared for six, seven, eight hours just in a coffee shop. And, I mean, he burst with this message. And we went back to Hungary and put a a few times. And he got this opportunity to minister in a, a, a maximum security prison um, in Saget. They have had no records of any foreigners ever getting into that facility. And uh, God just opened the doors for us to just, we had an awesome time there. But I won't go into that. I want, that's just background to what happened two weeks later. Joseph was sitting in a barber shop and he starts sharing with the barber about this time that we had in the prison, in Saget prison. And the barber says, well, why do you waste your time with those people? I mean, they are in there for life. This is murder and all the worst crimes. They've, uh, they've got no chance of really if you're there, you're there for decades, if you ever make it up. And Joseph starts sharing with the barber that the lost coin never loses its value. Come on. Yeah. Oh, that's right. yeah, come on. In fact, the only reason anything can be lost is because it belongs. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. And as he starts sharing with the barber the, the value of man, the, the, the image and likeness in man, that no matter how you try and suppress it, there is something incorruptible about the fact that you carry the DNA of God. Yeah. No matter how long it yeah. remains hidden, you put it in the right <laughs> environment, it's going to germinate. Yeah. Yeah. And you're going to see the image and likeness of God on display once again. Yeah. Yeah. And as he shares, he doesn't notice it, but two guys came and sat on each side of him. And one of the guys suddenly speaks to Joseph and says, um, is what you're saying true about me? Uh, he didn't even notice it. He said, it's undoubtedly true. He says, no, no, you, you need to be absolutely sure. That, do you know who I am? I, I spent, just imagine how God set up this meeting. He said, I've spent 20 years in that prison that you just spoke about. He went and got a photo of him. He showed him. 
the worst crimes you can imagine. He was the head of a mafia organization in, in the area. And the guy sitting on the other side was a hitman, wow. a professional assassin. And this guy says, before you give me any flowery words, I, will, I want to show you what I've done. Now I want you to look in the eye and say, is what you say true about me? Absolutely. And he said, this is more true about you. Amen. Jesus has a greater claim upon your life than your own mm -hmm. personal history. Come on. Yeah. Come on. And the guy said, okay, well, if this is true, you need to come and share it with my family. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they started making appointments for the weekend and, and the hitman says, I can't wait for the weekend. <laughs> uh, I need to speak to you and uh, they made an uh, appointment I think it was the next day they met again and Joseph started sharing with him that God knew him before he made him and no matter what detour he has taken he has not confused God about who he is he knows you better than what you know yourself <laughs> and this guy starts weeping and he says you don't understand I never weep you're the first man who sees my tears in this life and Joseph communicates with him that the same God who invested his own image and likeness within him is the God who came to redeem it once again oh, yeah. in Christ Jesus and, and as this guy discovers his value he looks at Joseph and he says tonight you need to come with me to the prostitutes they ran all the brothels in the area but the moment he discovered his value the people who they used and abused became valuable oh, yeah. and so he says Joseph come and they, that night they, they stood in a big room full of ladies as he ministered to them their value and their preciousness yes. to their maker. And this guy just weeps and weeps and he starts taking off the chains because it was like a symbol of his gangster identity. He, he takes off everything he has, just gives it to, to Joseph and he says, this is no longer me. Amen. This person that you're speaking about, that's me. <laughs> so Jesus discovers a faith that allows him to see value in the in lives that others thought is just worth standing. <laughs> but he doesn't just live an ordinary mundane life. He, he also faces the same kind of pain and contradiction that we face. In, in John 11, he goes to the funeral of, of a good friend, Lazarus. And, and he doesn't just observe Mary and Martha crying. He cries with them. Can you see that he is as fully human? And he is facing every situation, even as you have faced it. Now, now, when God becomes man, this is not the first time that he discovers what it's like to be human. Now, some people's idea is God in the Old Testament was quite quite a tough guy. He had all these rules we had to live by. We he thought, let me go find out why they struggle so much with this. And he lived as a human and he thought, oh, this is harder than what I thought. Let's, let's go back uh, and let's just cut the rules in half and we call it grace. Uh, so we can make it a bit easier. No, God, God has always known what it is like to be human because Colossians 1.17 says that in Him 
all things consist. In his hand is the breath of every living thing. When Paul speaks to the demon worshipping heathens in Acts 17, he says, I'm telling you about the one God who created everything, and from one source he made every family on, uh, uh, on earth. And and you know what? He's not far from you. That's right. What, what a message. Shouldn't he yeah. tell them to first repent? Right. Now, while they are still confused, the good news is, in your confusion, God is not confused. <laughs> while you don't know that He is with you, it doesn't mean He disappears. Right. 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 Long before you became aware of Him, right. He knew you. Right. Right. And so he tells them about the God who said that very brief you just took is the Spirit of God. Yes. <laughs> but, and before they could put their hands up and fill in the form, he tells them, <laughs> as your own poets have said, yeah. we are his offspring. Come on. Yeah. For in him we live, we move. And we have our being. So, God has always been with man. Why do you think He can hold us responsible even for sin? Because, you see, sin is not something that you do in your own time of your own energy. You, you don't really have your own time and your own energy. The time and energy you have is what was given to you. And it's, it's taking the very life and energy God gives and, and turning it against Him. But He can say, hey, we need to change. <laughs> and so God has never been ignorant of the human condition. In Him, all things consist. That means time itself. It's not just something that God exists in. It exists within God. And so, <laughs> when God becomes a man, this God in whom all things consist, He concentrates His own existence into this one person of Jesus Christ. That means that it has enormous implications for you. <coughs> because you were in Him. He did not become man for His own sake. Right, right. He became man for your sake. Yes. You were in Him, yes. in His life, in His death, in His resurrection, yes. in His ascension, yes. in His current existence. Yes. God in His yes. humanity yes. represents you. Right. Yes. And so when He when he comes within the incarnation, it is to demonstrate to what extent he has always been one with you. Not just with the people that lived up to that time. Hey, God has lived your whole life with you, even the part that you have not lived yet. And so within the incarnation, he comes to demonstrate within our time, space, dimension, within our history, how clearly he understands what it is like to be you. <laughs> this is the event in which God comes to show you. I do have a clue what it's like to be you. Right, right. Yes, I have seen with the eyes of flesh. And yes, my days has been like the days of man. And yes, I live by faith and not by sight. <laughs> Ultimately on the cross, this is where 
This is where he identifies with man in our deepest alienation from God. Everything that he speaks on the cross comes out of Psalms 22. And so the first thing he says, as man on our behalf, he takes upon himself the mindset of fallen humanity. And on our behalf, he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then as God, he proceeds to answer that question for us by entering into our hell. And in that act, he declares, I have never forsaken you, nor have I left you. In fact, I will rather go to hell than live without you. Wow. Oh. Oh. See, this is what Psalms 22 and 23 says. The truth comes out. It says, God has never forsaken the afflicted. Nor has He turned His face from us. This is where God identifies with us even in our deepest confusion. This is where the immortal God faces death. This is, this is the place where God Himself experiences what it is like to feel God forsaken. Hey, God knows you. Amen. God understands you. When this God comes to you and He says, you need to forget what lies behind. It's not because He doesn't understand the depth of your pain. It's not because He doesn't understand the size of the injustice that you have suffered or that you have made somebody else suffer. It's not because he doesn't know what it's like to be you. It's because he knows you better than what you know yourself. That you need to pay attention when he says, <laughs> I've done something. On that cross where he reached out and he took a hold of all the guilt, all the shame all the injustice and he brought it to one place mm -hmm. to bring it to final judgment wow. to bring it to a final conclusion oh. and his conclusion is evil will not have the final say in your life Amen. Amen. no matter what you have suffered no matter what you've been through, even if you come to a place of an unjust death, evil does not have the last word. Oh, yeah. I come to introduce you to resurrection life. Yeah. I come to introduce. I I have identified and I have experienced everything you've experienced with you so that I can liberate you to say now you can identify with me and come and experience everything that I experience. If God could take the most evil event ever. The event in which men and women who was created in his likeness and image turned against the innocent creator and murdered him. If he can take that event of murder and turn it into your salvation, then he knows how to take a hold of every memory of regret, yes. of every memory of pain in your life and redeem it and change it and give you a new perspective so that you can look back on your past 
and instead of seeing regret and pain, you see gratitude and thankfulness for a God who was in your hell with you, for a God who never forsook you, for a God who's absolutely, totally committed to you. And so your present moment is no longer the unbearable sum total of a regretful past. And the fearful future. But your present moment becomes the joyful conclusion that this God can make all things new. And my future is no longer bound to a fallen past. My future, <laughs> my future is no longer do to repeat the pain and the sorrow of the past. My future is in the hands of the God who makes all things new. Yeah. Yeah. And He is for you, not against you. God has never been your problem. <laughs> <laughs> the cross is not a legal transaction in which the father beats the living daylights out of his son to make himself feel better Jesus did not come and save you from a vengeful father yeah Jesus did not come to pay a price to a mafia boss <laughs> to change his mind about you. That's right. right. That's right. He has never been your problem. We were enemies. No, not us. It is a pagan idea to think that we bring sacrifices to change the mind of an angry God. Right. Ooh, that's, right. Right. Yeah. that's good. <laughs> it's a pagan Christianity that yeah. thinks Jesus is the perfect Ooh. sacrifice yeah. that changes the mind of God. Right. Wow. What is the perfect sacrifice for a God who says, I do not require your sacrifices and offerings? <laughs> Isn't it the sacrifice that forever invalidates our sacrificial system? Isn't it the sacrifice when, when John says, Behold the Lamb of God. In other words, this is not your sacrifice with which you change the mind of an angry God. This is God's initiative to sacrifice Himself, to change your mind. We will hang out. minds needed to be changed. Yes. Wow. That's good. We were the problem, not God. Oh, thank you, Papa. Yes. He's for you. Amen. Not against you. He has committed his own existence to your destiny. I mean, this is why Philippians 3 says, He emptied himself into human form. He bankrupted him. He burned all his bridges. He invested everything he had, everything he is, into human form. He's got no other investment. No other interest, no other hobby, but you. See, the good news is not that one day you can go to heaven and avoid hell. The good news is that God saw such value in your life that He left Him and came to you. Oh. <laughs> He's excited about your life right now, right here. 
This is why Jesus prays in John 17. He says, Father, I, I pray that you don't take them out of this world. Hey, I've been at prayer meetings where they've basically prayed, Father, please ignore Jesus and come get us. <laughs> Jesus prays. He says, Father, I pray that you don't take them. Why? Because he has not had enough of living his life in a human body on this planet. He wants to do it all over again in you. That's why he designed you as his image and his likeness. For God, you are his opportunity to live, to move, to have his being on this planet. He's excited about this life. You see, God's eternity is not just some timeless dimension. God fills time with His eternity. He does it by filling every temporal moment with value, with meaning. God has got no agenda to bring this world or this time to an end. We were passing by some placard that spoke about the end times. That word end is exactly the same word to say the goal or the fulfillment. <laughs> Ephesians 1 10. God purposed that in the fullness of time, He would conclude all things in heaven and on earth. The end has come already. <coughs> Jesus is the beginning and the end. Yeah. Jesus is not just another part of the story. This dispensational thinking is the biggest load of nonsense that will rob you from the joy of living now. Yeah. Jesus is not just another part of the story. He is the whole story. He's the end of distance between God and man. He's the end of confusion. He's the end of meaningless existence. He's the beginning. He's the beginning of a whole new life. In which I'm not looking forward to the end of time, but I'm looking forward to every moment because God is there. Yes. And heaven is where Christ is. I don't know how to stop. I think we'll have to come back. Remember, you're just beginning. Okay. <laughs> oh, God. Hallelujah. He's so excited about your life. Yes. I want to share one last thought with you. How is it possible for God to become a man and not cease to be God? I mean... When we think of God, we think of all these amazing qualities of omniscience, omnipotence, omnipresent, and He is all those things. But, but you know what? When we saw God in all His spectacular display through all, all, out all the Old Testament stories, Jesus comes and He reveals in Matthew eleven twenty seven. He says, "No one knows the Father." In fact. What he's saying, hey, despite your thousands of years of Bible study, <laughs> despite all your rituals, you've all missed it. Yeah. You see that 
a, a prominent thought about God amongst the Jewish nation at the time of Jesus coming. What they concentrated on a lot was the holiness of God. And for them, the holiness of God meant His utter separation from us. God is the completely transcendent, is the, the theological word, the completely other, the one who is before and beyond time and space. And, and they made so much of His otherness that they could not know Him. Jesus is God's initiative to reveal Himself. Amen. And when God reveals Himself, He does not surprise us with how different He is. He surprises us with how much like us <laughs> yeah. He is. Yeah. <laughs> he reveals to us Good. that God's holiness is not his utter separation from us. It is his complete and utter separation unto us. Come on. Come on. Wow. He is so separated to you that he has committed his own existence to humanity. God didn't just become man. You know, him and the Father just so oh, this is such a mess one of us will have to go sort it out and Jesus <laughs> Jesus pulled the short straw and said, so he thought I'll just hold my breath for 30 years and become man endure this pathetic existence and then with great relief get out of there again so that I can once again be the word it was in the beginning without all the limitations of, of human existence no God knew that he would become a man long before he designed man yeah. and he knew that once I become a man I will remain a man forever. Oh, yeah. God is still a man in the person of Jesus Christ. Yeah. This is why Colossians 2 verse 10 says, The fullness of the Godhead finds their most complete expression in a human body. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The body yeah. of Jesus Christ. And just in case you think that that's unique, that's not me. <laughs> Verse 10 says, and you. God didn't make you to irritate him. <laughs> God did not create you to frustrate him. When God thought of you, he thought of a unique way of being himself. <laughs> so why could God become a man and not cease to be God I can hear God whispering to Paul and he says you know Paul if I have all the faith and the power to move mountains but I have not love then I'm nothing I can hear God saying, do you know what, Paul? It is not my power that makes me me. I know you guys are very impressed with the spectacular, but let me let you in on a secret. It is not my power that makes me me. And he says, you know what, Paul? If, if you have all the knowledge and you can speak in all languages, if you know all things, but you have not love, you are nothing. In other words, Paul, it is not my omniscience that makes me, me. God could become a man without ceasing to be God. Because love is what makes God, God. And the human existence is in no way a limitation for the love of God to be displayed. And no matter where you are, no matter what situation you're in, you don't have to do anything spectacular. I can guarantee you, you have an opportunity to love. Amen. And to love 
is to be like God. That's right. More like more than anything else. <laughs> Love is what God is. <laughs> God wants to be Himself in you. <laughs> <laughs> he made you for this very reason <laughs> to express himself wow. to live his life in and through you hey he's excited about your life he likes you <laughs> mm, thank you papa yes. thank you for your word yes. Thank you for your spirit that comes to seal within our faith and our experience what has always been true about us. Thank you for what you have done in Christ, the decisive act in which you demonstrated your closeness to us, the decisive act in which you judged the law and all its requirements, sin and guilt, and everything that stood against us. You forever took it out of the way with such finality that you promise us in, in Hebrews 10, 17 that you will think of sin never again. <laughs> Thank you this evening, Lord. I just see you sweeping through this building and cleansing the consciousness of men and women, of bringing them into awareness of their blameless innocence. Bring us into awareness of the closeness of our God. Thank you, Papa. We declare your sins are forgiven. Your sicknesses are healed. You are reconciled to your Maker. <coughs> oh, thank you, Papa. Thank you, Papa. Mm, you know, there's, there's not one thought in God's mind concerning you that reminds Him of sin. He has cleansed his own conscience right. of sin. Wow. He remembers your sin no more. Right. And that is the reason why you can forget. When he tells you the things that, that forget the things that are past, he's not asking you to be irresponsible or to just... Uh, he knows... He understands. But he's challenging you to say, do you really think you are ever going to solve the injustice, the pain? Do you think so? No. There is one event in which God says, trust me, I solved it. And when you discover that you died together with them. Yeah. <laughs> when you discover that that was the final word on your life, <coughs> in which I concluded your whole story, and my conclusion is, despite what evil has done, I see tremendous value. <laughs> you are valuable beyond measure Amen. Amen. Glory. Glory.